In the beginning, there was nothing. And it was really boring. <laughs> then it exploded. We don't yet know where our universe came from, or what came before it. We don't even know if those questions make any sense. What we do know is that our universe and everything it contains burst into existence 13.8 billion years ago. Out of the seething bubble of energy that was the brand new universe, the first subatomic particles condensed. And for the next 380,000 years, the universe contained nothing but hot plasma. As it cooled, this plasma condensed into the first atoms. And at this point, we see the cosmic microwave background, the baby photo of the universe. These first atoms were spread pretty evenly, but this image shows us that there were parts of the universe that were a tiny bit more dense than others. These denser parts became the seeds around which the first stars and galaxies started to grow. Then the universe went dark. For hundreds of millions of years, there were no stars to light up the darkness. And we call this time the cosmic dark ages. Then, slowly, one by one, the first stars switched on and began to shine across the universe. Galaxies began to glow and merge and evolve. As the first stars died, from their ashes, new generations of stars emerged. Stars that have planets, and planets that have life. Here on Earth, we humans have always yearned to know what is out there. Our ancestors were fascinated by the night sky, and it's often said that astronomy is the second oldest profession. <laughs> when Galileo pointed a telescope at the night sky and first took us beyond the Earth, we learned that the moon has craters and mountains, that Jupiter has moons, and that Saturn has rings, and that they are a lot more interesting than the perfect spheres our ancestors imagined them to be. As telescopes got bigger and better, they took us beyond our solar system and out into the galaxy. We learned about the life and death of stars and where our sun came from. The 20th century took us out into the cosmos and we learned that our galaxy is one of many in a vast and growing universe. With a powerful enough telescope, we will be able to look right to the edge of the visible universe, to the end of the cosmic dark ages, and watch the evolution of the universe play out. Because telescopes allow us to see back in time. Even light takes a long time to travel across the universe. So the deeper we look into the cosmos, the longer ago that light was emitted, and the further back in time we are seeing. And that's why, in Western Australia and South Africa, we are building a really powerful radio telescope. It's called the Square Kilometre Array, because the combined collecting area of its thousands of antennas will be about one square kilometre. And it's designed to answer fundamental questions about life, the universe, and everything. A radio telescope as powerful as the SKA will be able to answer questions about how we got from a universe that was full of nothing but thinly spread hydrogen to stars and planets, and to us being here to ask these questions. What are dark matter and dark energy? These mysterious things make up most of the known cosmos and govern the size and shape of our universe. But we don't know what they are or how they work. How did the first stars and galaxies form? Are we alone in the cosmos? Or is there anybody else out there? Radio telescopes work with the light human eyes can't see. By catching these radio waves and turning them into something that makes sense to us, radio telescopes can tell us things about the universe our visible light telescopes cannot. In the SKA, radio signals from thousands of antennas spread over thousands of kilometres will be combined to simulate a single giant telescope capable of producing images of incredible sensitivity and resolution. And they will show us what was happening a long time ago in galaxies far, far away. To explore the unknown and push the boundaries of human knowledge deeper into the cosmos, the SKA must also push the boundaries of what is technologically possible. And this means lots of exciting, cutting-edge science for us to get involved in. The sheer scale of the SKA means we're facing challenges no other telescope builders have ever had to face. So to test the innovative technologies and solutions, we've built three precursor telescopes. 
one in South Africa and two in outback Western Australia. One of the challenges is noise. Our modern society is very noisy. Radio and TV channels broadcast powerful signals and our mobile phones and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi produce a constant cacophony of background radio noise that is really disturbing to a sensitive radio telescope. They need to be somewhere quiet, far away from towns and cities and the hustle and bustle of modern human life. So the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, the core of the Australian part of the SKA, is located more than 300 kilometres northeast of Geraldton. This site was already exceptionally radio quiet because it had a population of only 113 people in an area the size of the Netherlands. That's a population density of less than one human foot per square kilometre. The Australian government has recognised this as a valuable scientific asset and has put laws in place to keep the area quiet, designating the whole area within a 70 kilometre radius the Australian Radio Quiet Zone. So if you happen to be driving near the observatory, heading out into the middle of nowhere, stop for a while and enjoy the silence. And you might as well turn off your mobile and any other radio devices, because you won't have had any reception for at least four hours. The Murchison Observatory is home to two of SK's precursor telescopes, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder and the Murchison Widefield Array. ASCAP is an array of 36 radio dishes working together as a single instrument. It was built to test innovative radio telescope technologies, including CSIRO's new receiver design called the Phased Array Feed. Phased Array Feeds allow a single dish to observe and sort the signals from lots of different parts of the sky all at once. And this means the telescope can scan and rescan immense areas of sky many times faster than before. ASCAP will be used to map the distribution of hydrogen in the nearby universe, beyond our own galaxy. Hydrogen is the most abundant element of the in the universe and is the main ingredient of stars and galaxies. So ASCAP will study the formation of galaxies. By repeatedly rescanning huge areas of sky, ASCAP can spot anything that changes in the cosmos beyond our solar system. So there are going to be plenty of new discoveries and lots of new science. Right now, ASCAP is operating with only a handful of its 36 antennas, but it has already mapped hydrogen gas flowing between galaxies. It has studied the strange behaviour of some pulsars and looked for any unusual emissions from the collision of the two black holes that caused the gravitational wave event reported back in February. The Murchison Widefield Array, the MWA, is an entirely different kind of radio telescope that uses a very different design and layout to observe different parts of the cosmos. MWA is built by an international consortium of universities and is the world's first large N array. Large N is shorthand for a very large number of antennas. These antennas are arranged into tiles of 16 and MWA currently has 200 tiles. I'm sure you've already worked out that's a total of 3,200 antennas. These and the signals from each antenna and each tile are combined to construct a radio image of the sky. And this uses a very large amount of computing power. MWA can observe an area of sky even larger than ASCAP, and it does it at a different part of the radio spectrum. As well as studying the sun and the way the sun interacts with interstellar space, MWA is designed to observe the epoch of reionization the time when the first stars that formed after the Big Bang switched on and began to heat up the cold gas around them, causing that gas to glow with radio waves. MWA has also been used to study the interstellar medium, the thin wisps of dust and gas that float between stars in our galaxy. Closer to home, MWA proved the existence of ionospheric plasma ducts, tubes of ionised particles trapped in the upper atmosphere by Earth's magnetic field. As the SKA expands, MWA will continue to look right back to the edge of the visible universe and find out what it looked like back then. The Karoo region of South Africa is at first glance, and even at second glance, very similar to outback Western Australia. And in the Karoo, another SKA precursor, Meerkat, is well underway. It will have 64 dishes when it's finished, and that will make it the largest and most sensitive radio telescope of its kind. 
and it will continue to be the biggest and best until it's absorbed into the SKA. Meerkat is superficially similar to ASCAP, but uses a different dish design and very different receiver technology. Like ASCAP and MWA, it will study the distribution of galaxies, as well as hydrogen and other molecules in the distant universe. Earlier this year, with only 16 of its antennas up and running, Meerkat took its first images and discovered 1,300 new galaxies in an area of sky where only 70 galaxies had been seen before. ASCAP, MWA and Meerkat are outstanding telescopes in their own right and are already making lots of new scientific discoveries. Although none of them is finished yet, and they are operating at only a fraction of their design capacity. Together they offer a tantalising glimpse of the astounding images and science the SKA will deliver. In spite of this early success, the SKA still faces enormous challenges. At all three precursors, the antennas are at most a few kilometres from each other, but the SKA will have antennas hundreds and eventually thousands of kilometres apart, and the entire telescope from one end to the other must be synchronised to within a few billionths of a second. That's one challenge. Once fully operational, the SKA's antennas will deliver information at around 100 times the data rate of the entire internet. That's another challenge, and a huge amount of time, effort and thought is going into producing new processes and new software that can deal with the torrent of data. The SKA's central computer will have the processing power of 100 million PCs, and that requires a lot of energy. To meet this challenge and reduce energy costs, SKA engineers and scientists are developing processes that are five times more efficient than any others currently in existence. And while we're thinking about power, getting power to a site many hundreds of kilometres from the nearest grid connection is extremely expensive. So the very remote sites of SKA will be solar powered. The Murchison Observatory, the home of MWA and ASCAP, is already 40% solar powered and has the largest battery in Australia. We're using the light from our star to learn about stars at the very edge of the known universe. Solving these challenges will benefit all of us. There will be spin-off technologies that will work their way into our everyday lives. Sensitive electronics and advanced software developed for previous radio telescopes are now used in things like mobile phones and medical imaging equipment. With Wi-Fi, we change the world without you noticing. And that is a spin-off from radio astronomy research at CSIRO in the 1990s. In a very few years from now, you will be buying devices and using services that are based on technologies developed by SKA engineers and scientists. I don't play computer games much, but I liked the sound of this and would like to quote a surprisingly uplifting passage from Civilization VI. Some of you might know it. It is the nature of humankind to push itself toward the horizon. We test our limits. We face our fears. We rise to the challenge and become something greater than ourselves, a civilization. The SKA is the next step in humanity's exploration of the cosmos. The telescope itself will be a tribute to the imagination, creativity, intelligence and curiosity that has brought the human race to where we are today. The primary goal of the SKA is to study the universe, and it will deliver the most stunning images of deep space that we have ever seen. It will discover fascinating new places and unveil amazing new science. It will help us to understand our place in the cosmos, and perhaps it will help us find out if there is anybody else out there. Thank you.